You may recognize this gentleman from a viral video he did in which he quit his job. We're going to catch up with him right now in this episode of XTV Newsers. Hi, I'm XTV producer Jennifer Moore, and with me right now is Anthony Ponce. Thank you so much for being here. And if you don't know who Anthony is, last year he had a viral video on Facebook where he quit his job at NBC Chicago, and he announced that he was going to be driving for Lyft and starting a podcast called Backseat Rider. So Anthony, how are you doing right now? I'm doing great. I'm actually just now proof listening to the 60th episode of Backseat Rider right now, which is scheduled to post tomorrow. So it's still going strong. Very cool. Now, I, I listened to a couple episodes and they were, they were very interesting to listen to. I, I, you know, so we'll get into that. Um, but I want to ask you first, how did you get into the business and what sort of TV jobs did you have? Uh, I got into the business back in 2003 after I graduated from journalism school at Northwestern. Um, my dad had been a longtime broadcaster here in Chicago. He was on Chicago News for many years. He still is, in fact. He does a, uh, a local public affairs and news analysis show called Chicago Tonight, which is on PBS every, every weeknight. And, um, and so that may have planted the seed, but I went to journalism school and then I worked a, a number of TV jobs in from like 03 to 05 i was in fort wayne indiana and then i went to indianapolis for a couple of years working in local news and then i worked in local news here in chicago for a, almost 10 years from 07 until the last year till 2016. so it was about nine years and that's the point which i launched backseat rider and you're your family is actually in the news business as well. Are they part of the reason why you wanted to do it initially, or did you have another reason? Um, you know, they may have planted the seed, um, but the real reason that I wanted to do it to begin with was for the variety. I was always one of those, I'm not sure about you, but I was one of those people that could never really settle on one topic or one activity, and so journalism was perfect, perfect for that, because you could cover something different every day and get a little bit of a different experience every day. You weren't sitting behind a desk. So those two factors were the main reason. And I actually like the performance aspect of broadcasting too. Um, you know, it was like you have this um, little performance to give every, every day and you have that kind of sense of accomplishment when you're going home at night. You can say, oh, I did that with my day. Like I like that sense of you know, a completed project and a completed contribution every day. So those factors are what led me to journalism in the first place. Awesome. And was that, was that pretty much your favorite part about working in news? Was I would say so. Okay. I would say so. The variety was my favorite part. And just the not being behind a desk was great. Yeah. Like I had worked previously before journalism school in this business job where it was like I was in a cubicle all day and I knew that I could never do that again. So it was a little office spacey, like? It was. In fact, it's funny that you mentioned office space because the logo for the company that I worked for looked exactly like the company logo in the movie, like the fake company logo in the movie Office Space. It was like three triangles. And so when I saw the movie Office Space, I loved that movie. But at the same time, I was like, this You're is like, a no. little bit too true. This is a little bit too true. Yeah, I think, I think we can all relate to that. And what was, in your opinion, the worst part about working in news? Oh, the worst part about working in news. Let's say, I would say, honestly, um, <laughs> the egos, <laughs> the egos. I didn't enjoy the ego factor. I feel like a lot yeah. of people, um, and the thing is, it's, it's a quality in myself that I don't like either. But I notice that the, the, it's, it's a, it's kind of a um, epidemic in local news. I think you have a lot of very ego-driven people and, um, and they're in it for not all the right reasons. Like I worked with a lot of people over my TV news career that I could tell were more into being on TV than they were into telling meaningful stories. Now that said, I'm one of them too. I liked being on TV. I like the whole local celebrity aspect of it. However, um, I feel like my true passion is telling meaningful stories and contributing those stories to the world. And I felt like at least in my 
experience, like the people that were in uh, my field of view over the course of my journalism career, there was just a lot of egos and there was a lot of people that weren't in it uh, for the right reasons. They were in it for the celebrity too much and yeah. not for the storytelling enough. And then it became this like competition, like who's got the most um, uh, followers on, on Instagram and things like that. And then when it started going in that direction, that's when I started getting a little bit like, okay, how can I, um, how can I do something that feels a little more closer to my heart? That's a really interesting answer. And, and yeah, I, I worked as a producer and as a, an assignment editor and you kind of felt the way, like it was reflected in the way someone treated you. Yeah. And it was so clear who was like a real journalist and then who just, just wanted the celebrity. Exactly. And, and it's, and it was so like, and you, you can tell from working in newsrooms, it's really obvious once you meet someone and talk to them for a few minutes. And I'm sure as a producer, it's probably an even more acute feeling mm -hmm. um, because you've probably do, like, you know, there's this kind of separation in newsrooms between talent yeah. and producers and assignment editors. And, you know, there's this division. And so um, I bet it's very, very obvious from your point of view as a producer as well, who the people are that are in it for the storytelling, that are in it for the journalism, and who are in it for the more, uh, you know, superficial reasons. Exactly. I even remember we had a celebrity guest come in and he was like a pretty big jerk to me. Mm -hmm. And then when he got in the studio and he saw the anchors, he like flipped like a switch. I was like, oh, what right. the heck, man? Yeah. So yeah. we saw yeah. that all, I saw that all the time. Yep. All right. So I want to ask what, is there anything about the world of TV news that you kind of feel like maybe gets a bad rap or is misunderstood by people? Um, let's see. Misunderstood. Um, well, you know what? I think that the true journalists sometimes tend to get lumped in with the BSers. And so I think that it's one of those things where, um, you know, if the bad apples can tend to, especially in this environment right now, where if there are quote unquote bad apples that are not in it for the right reasons that are spinning stories or um, that are not telling a balanced version of a story, they're kind of wrecking it for the, the people that are in it for the pure reasons. And so there was a big part of what I did uh, in 2016 when I launched Backseat Rider that was kind of out of frustration and disillusionment um, at that aspect of it. Like I couldn't stand when I would show up to a story and all the reporters that had kind of gotten to the scene maybe before me had like wrecked the scene where it's like maybe they were not sensitive enough maybe they were um just didn't approach a sensitive news scene with tact and with uh, professionalism and then i would show up and try to salvage what i could at a news scene for example and it would be totally spoiled and i think in a lot of situations i would feel like the reputation of broadcast journalists preceded me. And so I was lumped in with, um, with this, uh, the mainstream media, you know what I mean? And that was frustrating for me. I think when you hear the phrase mainstream media now, there's negative connotations to yeah. it, right? And what does, that even, what does that even mean? Like, and now we have all these new media outlets and when do they become mainstream too? Because yeah. they have a huge audience. Exactly. You know, people just see, yeah, people are like oh, the mainstream media or the lamestream media. And yes, you know, what is yes. that even like? What so that's, does so that there even are a lot of, it's, it's funny. You're right. I, it's, it's got these negative connotations, but there's a lot of good journalists in the so-called mainstream yeah. media. And so it was kind of, it got frustrating to kind of have that um, be my identifying tattoo or stamp before I even met somebody, you know, they're like, Oh, you work for NBC. Oh, you're a local news guy. You got this microphone and product in your hair and a tie. That means you are this. And you know, I don't, you know? I don't think people realize how stressful that job is being an on-air reporter or anchor. You guys get so much hate or so much criticism. Oh, yeah. You know, if you're, if your tie looks, they don't like oh, yeah. your tie or whatever, they'll break you. Especially for know. women, especially yeah. for women. If a woman <laughs> anchor or reporter is wearing something that is disagreeable to a viewer. The viewer is not like a lot of times the viewer is not even paying attention to the words or the story itself. They're like, Oh, I don't like that top. 
or I don't like that. Like, how could you be outside? Of, oh, that's a distasteful. So it's, I think you're right about that. And it's even worse for the women. Do you remember any like really weird emails or comments that stuck out to you from like a viewer? Oh, I got tons. I got, um, okay. I was sweating at the armpits one during one report. It's like, Hey man, that happens. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Right. It might've been hot out or something or hot. It, there might not have been a AC in the room. And I remember I got a letter in the mail, it was a, like <laughs> snail mail with oh a gosh. printed photograph. I don't know how the person like printed it out of my pit sweat. <laughs> and um like sent it to me like with an arrow pointing to the pit sweat like with some offensive written that's just one example that comes to mind but yeah i get all this random email and that's just kind of part you know in a way it's part of the it's part of the gig you know you get a lot of um you know it's it, it comes with a certain amount of prestige i suppose you know you're on tv you're admired by people who think that just because you're on tv means you're cool or something like that but then but the pit stain letters too then you get the pit stain letters so it it kind of balances out yeah it was very creepy that's that's extremely creepy over your long career is there a certain story that really sticks out to you as being memorable maybe for a good or a bad reason yeah um i was just telling my dad about this the other night for some reason um i did this story where this young girl on the south side of chicago um was turn she had a uh, she was i believe she suffered from leukemia or a rare form of cancer and she was terminal it was a really sad situation and, and i went down and did oh they named a street after her i believe they named like a street corner after her and so i was there and in the course of my interview with her she mentioned that she was just obsessed with taylor swift and, and, and one of the things that she wanted to do, um, you know, in the short term was go to the Taylor Swift concert, which was coming up in a couple of months, right? And she mentioned that um, she would love to meet Taylor and all this stuff. And so in my live tag, I just decided to say, Taylor Swift, if you happen to catch this story, Emily, the girl, Emily Beasley uh, was her name would love to meet you um, at that show. And I think Emily's favorite colors were green and purple. And was, I'd have to look back at the exact story, but the, to, to make a long story short, Taylor Swift saw the story, invited Emily backstage, and then wore green and purple. And it was this huge thing um, for Emily. And Taylor, Taylor Swift completely stepped up to the plate and like made it the most memorable, um, the most memorable night. And a lot of that was because of this Southside community really came together around Emily. And I remember after the story ran and Taylor got in touch with Emily, they made this video where they were all in green and purple. And the video, that video that they made wound up reaching Taylor. And then it was this huge deal when she came to Chicago to give the concert. So that was that was a really impactful one for me. I can see why you'd remember. And Taylor Swift is one of those celebrities. She really finds a way to connect with her fans. Yeah. And you got you to appreciate that. For sure. Now, let's, we were just talking about viral stories. You actually had a viral video. So mm-hmm. you're the only person I've talked to so far that has had that experience. So mm-hmm. how do you like, feel, what kind of attributes do you think stories go, have that go viral okay. like yours? Uh, the, you know, the funny thing is if I knew the answer to that, then I'd probably be like, well, a wealthy person, (laughs) which I'm not. So I don't think there's a magic formula. I think it has to, it has to, it has to pull you in right away Mm -hmm. because everybody is scrolling. So that's one aspect of a viral video. I think it does have to pull you in right away, whether it's the, title of it and in that one i titled it why i quit nbc the full story and i think that um title probably pulled people in a little bit why I, well this guy quit nbc i think i might recognize him um and then maybe some aspect of it is it's visual as well and i think so the title of it why i quit nbc and then it was this video of me i grabbed my box this box i don't know if you remember i was carrying the box out of the out of nbc tower and I think that was a visual element. And the other thing is that we subtitled it. 
um, there were subtitles on it so that you didn't need to have the volume up on your phone or your computer if you were watching it. So it was easy to follow the plot of the video without turning your volume up. So, you know, there are viral videos where the video itself is so powerful that you don't need any subtitles or anything like that. Mine it was just a guy walking out of an office. It's not the most visual thing, but the subtitles are what did it without you having to turn it on. So um, I think that other, the other aspect of my particular one was it was, I had a lot of people cheering for me after that. And so it was, a, I think that people connected with the, you know, F you to the man kind of aspect of it as well. So visual um, catches you right away and then um, the story connects on some level, it doesn't have to be inspirational, it doesn't have to be F you to the man, but those three are, are important and I think there are countless different ways to achieve that magical um, combination and formula. If I knew the exact formula, I'd, again, I, mean, I would you, probably start be- a company like Viral Videos or something. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But those three factors, story, value, visual, and catches you right away, I think they're probably pretty common among viral videos. And how did you come up with the idea for that? Wow, um, how did I come up with the uh, idea? Okay, I had a lot of ideas running through my mind leading up to that about how I could make a splash. Because basically, I wanted to make a splash so that people would listen to the first episode of the podcast. I, I wasn't expecting a viral video. I just wanted something that connected in a decent enough way. And so one, I like, you know, I floated the idea of, hey, could I do something live on the air on my last day on the anchor desk or something like that? Could I do something surprising or prepare a video? And in the end, I was like, you know what? I don't want to like do anything too crazy. I don't want to burn any bridges. I really didn't have that much ill will like, mm -hmm. toward the people that I worked with. It was more me wanting to get out of the business. And I had also been passed over for this promotion. And so I didn't want to come across as any like bitter or anything like that. I really just wanted to hit the reset button in kind of a positive way. And so once I scrapped the idea of doing something live on the air, I was like, well, how can I make a, um, you know, how can I make a meaningful story that'll be kind of concise? And um, I remember checking with my agent. I was like, could I shoot something in the newsroom, you know, saying goodbye to people? And he's like, no, that wouldn't be like, you could... If it doesn't go over well, you could get like sued. Yeah, because because you're shooting on their property. On their so, property. Because yeah, I I noticed you did all the things right with that video, like you shot it out. Because <laughs> I shot a similar video when I quit, and I made oh, sure yeah. to shoot it outside. I made sure to shoot it. I had my husband shoot me outside CNN a few weeks before I quit. Oh, all right, like, yeah. Because and I I'd seen your video. I was like, that's actually not a bad idea. And I'd seen all these people on YouTube making why I quit BuzzFeed videos. And no one had ever made an I Quit CNN video. So I was like, I can do one of those. Oh, there you um, go. And I'd Perfect. seen your video. I was like, that's actually really, but I saw, I noticed you get, you shot, you got all the elements. You chose a good platform, Facebook, which is ripe for sharing. Mm -hmm. And it was a good story. I think everybody can relate to wanting to do something else and wanting to make a change in your life. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah. and everyone, my, my wife was also the one that shot, uh, shot that video. She, we just pulled out a selfie stick that I had been given a few weeks earlier and she just walked backwards while I was walking into the car. And I just figured, you know, after being in, why not? in local news, you, you know how to tell a short 90 yeah. second story. And I was like, nothing could tell my story better than walking from my former workplace to my new workplace, which is the car. Is the so, car. and once my agent was like, don't do it inside. It was, it yeah. was obvious to me. And the agent on the phone, like laughing at you was a really good touch too. Thank you. Yeah, I got lucky on that one because I didn't plan that. It was just, you know, when you're a reporter and a storyteller, you, you think to yourself, you take inventory. You're like, what elements do I have? And I was like, oh, I shot my agent on the iPhone in case, you know, to document if I do take this plunge, I'm documenting my journey. This is a great asset that I have on my phone for a video. And so I was like, oh, how do I incorporate that? And so I worked backwards from that. And I think that's a good lesson. There's a, obviously we're on YouTube right now and there's a lot of uh, YouTubers that I think are having difficulty or they find storytelling challenging, but I think these are really good lessons for me. Like, Hey, you know, you can use your phone, use what you have around oh, you yeah. Yeah. and yeah. always cool. try to tell a visual story. So mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that. I just, you know, in that video, I think really 
hit a lot of people and and I thought it was very I thought it was very inspiring and I thought you did it in a classy way where Thank it wasn't you. like where it wasn't like I hate I hate everybody right. I hate my job right exactly I, I think this is more about you than it does the workplace totally totally now um I'm more candid with the people that I know really well but um they you know I think they all supported the gen the like the genuine inspiration for it and that is let's hit the reset button let's try a different kind of uh journalism and see I figured now's the time if I'm ever going to take a risk just like you yeah. it's like if you're ever going to take a risk it's like now's the time um to try it and see if it connects with people exactly all right so you've worked with a lot of media relations folks over the years people in PR um Mm -hmm. What kind of advice would you give anyone watching right now who's who are in those businesses if they want to connect and build relationships with media outlets? Yeah, um, my big thing about that is, you know, when I, if, if, it, if we're talking about a major news outlet, a lot of times, and I'm sure you got this when you were at CNN too, just dozens and dozens of like PR emails that you could tell you were on some list. and it meant nothing. Like I, I would actually, after a while, have those immediately sent to my spam folder because I get so many messages from PR people trying to get my attention. What they don't do well enough is pay attention to each individual reporter, their style, the kinds of reports that they tend to give, and also the news cycle. Um, if there is a situation like MLK Day yesterday, maybe there is a, a really good pitch that, is, that has to do with this day of service or making the most out of a day off, where it's very specific to that news day. And so, because as you know, like in a morning meeting where you're deciding what to put on the news that night, anything can rise to the top. If it's a good enough story, it doesn't matter if like, someone has a preconceived notion of what they're going to do with their Wednesday 5 p.m. newscast. If something is better, boom, that thing's bumped to the top. And so what I don't think PR people realize enough is to really, really pay attention to the news cycle that day. What's happening that day? How can I pitch a story or a, um, an interviewee or a client in a way that's meaningful that comes across as newsworthy rather than some kind of ad so they don't do a good enough job doing their background research and following the news really carefully. And like, hey, if it's MLK Day and I know that Anthony Ponce is the person that usually tends to cover stories like what people are doing with their day off, maybe I have a client that has a cool indoor um, playground or something um, that I could pitch this. Like, hey, if you're looking for an element for this story today, I've got a great one for you. And that way, it's personal. I would actually think of it as a resource. Like, oh my gosh, yeah, I am kind of looking for elements. I want to make my story unique. This would be good to go to this fun indoor gym that I've never been to that would be visual. Does that make sense? Yes, it really does. And I'm glad I've, I've been asking people this question because everyone has such a different but good answer. Oh, good. So I hope, I think this will be helpful, you know, because a lot, this, this channel is really for people who want to understand the media industry. Yeah. And I really want it to be for people on YouTube that don't know enough about the news business or just maybe, you know, want to be a better storyteller. Uh, yeah, if, if any PR people, real quick before we move on, if any PR people are listening to this and they're like not getting any emails back or calls back, That's quit, with the, quit with the email blasts. <laughs> Don't have a massive press release yeah. that you just send out. It feels so impersonal. We delete them immediately. Do your research, Do, pick and choose who you're going to email when because Think about those people. It's like spam after a while. Like there's this one woman I'm thinking of right now that emails me, I want to say two to three times a week. With even now? Form, oh yeah, even, oh, even now. Formulaic press releases oh, from man. her organization. I don't even read them anymore. But if like I did it first because I was like, oh, I haven't heard, like I haven't heard from her since that story. What does she have to say? You get like one or two ups at bat. But after yeah, that, like, if your story is not relevant, it's the delete button. There's way too much information coming at us these days. Stop with the email yes. blast. Start with personal pitches that are related to the news that day. And, and definitely sent to the right people. Like sometimes a lot of PR people would send things to the anchors when they're not the people you, right. they should be sending. They're not the gatekeepers. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I think getting in touch with the, or even at CNN, I would get, I had nothing to do with 
that sort of thing. And people would be like, you know, um, I would get calls from PR people all the time. They'd be like, well, can you get me to Anderson Cooper show? I'm like, like, do you know how much yeah. work that would be for me? Like right now, yeah. like they don't understand. I, I felt like I, on a percentage, I would say 90% of the stuff I got was crap. And the maybe 10% was okay. Uh -huh. but, and that, I've talked to other sense. people. Yeah, I'd go 95-5. 95-5. Like, I'm, yeah, and we're being probably kind of conservative here, but, right. you know, but that's that's a really good advice for anyone who's, who's watching like that, uh, which leads me to my next question. There are a lot of even YouTubers that still want to get noticed by traditional media outlets. How would you go about doing it or what kind of advice would you have for, for those folks? For a YouTuber? Hmm. Like if they're like a daily vlogger or maybe they are, maybe have, have a channel about a certain niche, like, a, you know, they do cooking or there's beauty vloggers, like, mm -hmm. and some of them, maybe some of the bigger channels, they, they are interested in getting some publicity for what they're, what they're doing. Yeah. Um, well, it's funny. That's an interesting question because I think that the tide is changing so that the news in the news industry is going to start asking the question yeah. in reverse. How can I get noticed on these massive YouTube channels? Um, I think that like if you're a YouTuber, um, the, the, the first place to get is to get a big enough following so that you do become kind of a news maker. And the things that you are, the content that you have on your channel is going to rise above the rest of, um, rest of the thousands of YouTubers out there. Um, I'm not sure it's sh like, as, as I consider this question for the first time, I'm like, my initial reaction is I'm not sure that that should be a goal of a YouTuber to get local uh, notice on a local news station. I mean, maybe it's a good feather in. Apparently I've, I've been talking to some YouTubers and apparently they really do want to do traditional media. They and do. The part was, and I was like, why? Like you guys have more views. And they're like, because yeah. to get brand deals or to get speaking engagements, they still need to have, like, I was on GMA on their resume or, you know, I did a Today Show appearance or right. I was on my local Channel 5. Because uh, apparently the people in the suits that make decisions at companies still see that as being relevant, which, is, which I thought was very interesting. So if they okay. do have a book well, coming out or if they do have something they're doing, I guess... Then, my, then I think my advice, if that's the case and people do want to be featured on local news because it builds their brand, that, that's understandable. That makes sense. I was like, that's an interesting way to put it. So Yeah, so. Then, I would say, then I would say the same thing I would to the PR folks and that is bring something to the table. Bring something unique. Um, if you do have a fashion blog or a daily thing and you have a unique perspective um, or a source, even a source, um, that you've interviewed that would be a good source for a local news person um, to tap as well to start building those relationships get um, you know establish a, a rapport with a local reporter or a number of local reporters or national reporters like hey just FYI this might be a good element for you establish a relationship and good things could come from that um, if you position yourself as an expert as well Make sure that you, um, once you have that relationship established, make sure that you are able to convey, hey, this is what I could bring to your report. If, you, if, I'm, if I'm featured on this, make sure you spell it out like, hey, you're missing this huge aspect of this topic, whether it's health or fitness or cooking or whatever. You might want to keep this in mind. If you want, to, if you want I can speak on that. Um, one question to always ask yourself is, how can I make the reporter's job easier that day? Exactly. Yeah. We're on, it's, it's, it, that's a huge point of leverage because the local reporters, they're on deadlines. You know, it's a five o'clock deadline. We need, I would ideally just want these elements of a story to come my way. And if you can put yourself in the position of the reporter, how can I make this person's job easier? The reporter is going to notice because that's less work for the reporter on deadline, right? Um, and so if you can leverage that uh, deadline driven um, dynamic, then you could get more attention in your, in your favor. That's so true because you guys, it is a pretty high stress job and I don't oh, yeah. think people realize how time sensitive it is. So yeah, anything that people can do to, like if they come to the station for an interview, yes. that saves you time. Oh, and exactly. I don't think folks realize how, how 
dependent you guys are on geographic location. Oh gosh, like yes. if like, something's two hours outside of Chicago, what would the likelihood you'd go? Definitely. Not very likely. There, there was this. I remember I was doing a story. Some uh, it had to do with dogs. I can't remember if it was like. Oh, it was dogs and fireworks, right? You know how dogs do not react well to fireworks? So it was 4th of July. We were doing a pet angle. And I mean, I literally got on the internet. There's, think about how many like dog experts, pet stores, shelters would want to be a part of that story, right? Anyone can, any person familiar with dogs could be able to could get that interview and, and have that on their website, like featured on NBC, right? It came down to, who was the first person to respond? Who was, exactly. and who was the closest? Like I had a, a bunch of people respond, but somewhere out in the suburbs, it's like, no, I'm going on the air at 4.30. I need the person who's in the West Loop of Chicago 10 minutes away. Um, and so that's how I, pr people don't realize that it comes down to luck, location, timing, who calls back. So yeah, you got to maximize those, you got to maximize all those things in order to break through. Really good, really good points. Now, I do want to ask, for, there are a lot of people who want to have a career like you had in broadcast news. Mm -hmm. What kind of advice would you give them right now in 2018? Man, um, you mean the traditional route? Traditional route, yeah. <laughs> they, they, want to, they want to go to, you know, Market 145 and be a reporter. Go to, um, what would you, you're like, <laughs> Yeah, uh, I don't know how much it's changed since I did the whole thing. I mean, I know when I was doing it, I was sending out VHS tapes. Um, I'm 39 years old, by the way. So I was doing this whole uh, process in 03. But I think that, um, you know, my advice would be to obviously be multifaceted because you, I don't think it's the case anymore where you're just going to be a standard reporter where you're on camera for a couple shows a day and then you call it a day you need to be able to write shoot your own stuff edit your own stuff have a strong instagram for uh instagram facebook twitter presence be very familiar with all those um oh and and be able to give live updates throughout the day like on your phone that's that's what it was when i left nbc it was it was they were expanding the the role of the traditional reporter from you know Two, two to three live shots a day to, you know, nine Twitter updates, Facebook Live when you get to a scene, um, all kinds of things. So you need to be completely, I think you need to be a jack of all trades. Um, you need to be able to write those stories. You need to be able to tell, um, oh, send pic be a good photographer with your phone and send pictures back in real time, posting all those. So you need to have that skill set and also just be working like I like it was when when I entered the game be working willing to work really hard for not a lot of money and this this really is a a, a very changing business would you suggest to maybe journalism students that they also explore like non-traditional outlets like it sounds like you're you would definitely be going that route if you were like I know yeah. I would if I was 18 or 22 today I would definitely be looking into other stuff just because it is so different and there's so much else out there now that there wasn't exactly I think we that it, it, de it definitely comes down to kind of what um what school of thought and philosophy you believe in I mean there's a huge you know there's a huge belief right now that I'm that I think I subscribe to to some extent where it's like news in the traditional sense is going to be gradually dying out um I don't know a whole lot of millennials that are rushing home to watch the 4 30 5 p.m and 10 p.m newscasts they will have gotten their news already throughout the day on social media usually um so i think that um one one way to kind of distinguish yourself is that if you are proficient on these social media that are right now the most popular, which are, you know, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, if you can build a niche audience um, in that, you may be able to set yourself up uh, and set yourself away from the pack uh, rather than going that traditional route. Um, one, one analogy that I love is if everyone's trying to get through the front door, find the side door. Okay, find the side door. And that's why I went the podcasting route is, you know, I have this very loyal, dedicated audience now that is used to hearing my voice in their ear once for 
between 45 minutes and an hour every single week. I have a very personal relationship with the backseat rider audience at this point. And it's in the tens of thousands. So regardless of whether I go, what direction I go in, I have this connection. And I think that more than anything, especially in the environment that has been created by the last election cycle and the current president, having an authentic connection with your audience, a meaningful one that means something, where you're not just another face reading off a teleprompter or with a mic flag standing in the, in the, in the snow, that's gonna be the difference going forward because nobody knows what is going to happen with this situation, right? If, if the mainstream media and all these traditional news outlets with letters like NBC, CBS, and ABC next to them are the Titanic, <laughs> gradually like destined to like these huge behemoths now but they're destined to sink maybe they are maybe they're destined to sink if they sink where's your life where's your lifeboat do you have a life vest on um and so yeah, where are you going to jump to if your job gets eliminated or exactly no exactly and so and so one of the things that that's important right now for me is my audience right now my podcasting audience that know who i am that have a meaningful deep personal connection with me um, those in a way um, not to objectify them too much but I, I, I think of those, them as kind of my 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 rescue boat or my life uh, my lifeboat what do they call them anyway on the Titanic like life wait oh, lifeboats? lifeboats I think they, were called, they call them lifeboats in the movie right I think okay yeah maybe yeah so so Although that was so, that was a really long movie Man. so fi figure out what your um, Figure out what your escape route is or your, or your life preserver, your lifeboat. Make sure that you're um, connecting me in a meaningful way with your, um, with your audience. So I think you and I have kind of similar views on the way the business is going overall. Do you think there's anything that can save TV news? More authenticity, um, less formulaic delivery. Um, I think... I think um, it has gotten away from this genuine, I connect with you, I connect with the story. Um, this is something different. I think that like, from my vantage point, a lot of local news has become this template where it's different numbers, different names, but the same broadcast kind of over and over. Yeah, And I think that people are kind of tired of that. I don't think people are connecting with it in a um, meaningful way anymore. And so I think the key to that is being, being authentic and, um, you know, striving for that um, kind of organic delivery, <laughs> uh, being yourself. I think people know when you're being yourself and, they know when you're trying to toe the line. And so I would love to see more newscasters kind of, um, I know there's, um, there's journalistic objectivity that needs to be paid attention to, but I think that being, um, being, being yourself on camera um, and knowing that, hey, th if you're yourself and you say, here's one side of the story, here's the other side of the story, there's a way to achieve that without, um, I think when people fall into that robotic delivery, that anchorman delivery coming up after the break, we're gonna explore why certain people do not agree. You know, when, when they hear that tone and when you're trying to imitate the other newscaster that you see and admire, when you, people can see right through that and they don't connect. And that's when, that's when everyone's getting in trouble right now is because you, know, you have this whole fake news movement and if there's not a genuine connection and trust and kind of, you know, this person's being authentic, this person's being themselves, um, that's, when, um, that's when trust gets even more eroded. So I would like to see more um, broadcasters. And I think this is why a lot of YouTubers are coming up right now. And, um, and, that's a, and Facebookers and podcasters is because there's this true connection where you trust that person. And, um, and I think that is the, I think that's the name of the game right now.
that those are all excellent, excellent points. So we all know what you are doing after you quit your job. Kind of what happened after the video? And I will say this. One thing I think you did that was very smart about your video is that you had you used it as a springboard versus a lot of people get a viral video and they don't have anything to push to. Mm-hmm. Like they it, like they get 10 million views, but they didn't they weren't thinking about it beforehand, so they can't leverage it into something else. Yeah. And you pretty successfully did that. You got a deal with podcast one. Yeah. I saw some of your update videos you posted on YouTube. So you ended up, do you feel like that deal would not have happened if you hadn't had the video? Yeah, I don't feel like it would have happened. Um, and so, yeah, you have to, like, there's something like 350,000 podcasts right now. And so, you know, to be on podcast one is a big, is a big gun. Um, it's one of those things that um, gave me the launch pad um, that I needed. And the key, the right viral video or a launch pad like that is temporary. It's a one shot deal. If you don't have good content to back that up, that's a problem. You know, that launch pad's not going to mean anything. So the key is like you alluded to is have a, um, have something good on the back end of that. Um, so one thing I've been learning and it's a constant struggle, I'm a content creator, but at the same time, there's a business aspect to this. There's a marketing aspect to this. It's like a, Uh, that doesn't come naturally to me. I'm not the best self promoter. Um, That video might have maybe in my mind, it was kind of a fluke because what I really just wanted to do is, is tell good stories, you know, tell other people's stories, not my own. And um, so I think that having solid content on the back end of a launch pad like that is the key. So what happened with me um, since that viral video is I had a big spike, and then it dropped off a little bit and as it naturally is going to like you're, if you have a viral video not everyone who sees and shares and follows you is going to um, connect with uh, what you're about to bring to the table but so there was a drop off and then what i've seen is just a gradual building you know so on the upswing it's it's a long it's a marathon not a sprint so at this point like i have a really really good audience every week we have like way more than a hundred thousand downloads on our podcast every month. That's um, fantastic. Those are really yeah. good numbers. Yeah. It's, I mean, we crossed the 2 million mark, um, in terms of downloads, uh, maybe a month ago or so, which is a big milestone because people are listening and there's advertising, uh, potential in that. And that, again, that's the part of this whole deal that I'm not good at, but podcast one does have a sales team, which is nice. So I do have sponsors on the podcast it's like one of those things where you have to hang in there you have to hang in there and um and and know that there's going to be good weeks and bad weeks and uh keep going believe it you know if you believe in your product and you have uh and you're telling good stories then it'll grow like an audience on the in in this day and age uh will find you uh, even if it takes a while. So right now we're in episode 60. I'm just actually right before this uh, interview, I was halfway through listening to what my editor sent back to me for episode 60. Um, and so we've been doing them every week and um, it's, um, it's really cool. We have a Facebook community group that's growing. It's now more than a thousand people where they will get in the Facebook group and talk about each episode and the, the, the passengers that were in that episode. And what I'll do is I'll reach, I, I'm really too, two sided. And with my um, relationship with them, like all I, I'm, I have no problem being like, Hey guys, what should I ask the passengers this week? Like what, what, what's on your mind? What do you care about? Um, and so fostering a two sided, um, what's the, not, it's not a unilateral it's relationship. It's more like a dial. It's definitely it's a dialogue, more of a dialogue and a conversation you're starting yeah. here. Yeah. And so I think that's, that's another key in terms of um, what, what advice I would have for up and comers would be, do you have a two, do you have a dialogue with your audience? Now, I remember reading back when you first did this, you know, you got a few articles, you got several like online outlets doing articles about you. And I read that you liked the voice aspect because you felt like when people get a camera in their face, they kind of shut down. But yeah. when people are just on their voices heard, they're a little more comfortable with the situation. And I thought that was a really 
good thing to keep in mind because yeah, like, you know, from working in TV, you know, people are, people are kind of scared of cameras, but they're not as scared of you just recording their voice. Have you kind of found that to be a lot easier? Yes. Um, And I think that the more and more like that people are on camera where this is the camera instead of a huge yeah, like, over the shoulder. It's a lot less intimidating. It's less intimidating. And I think this new generation, like I've noticed that my little nieces, for example, know when the camera, you know, when they're, it's like they're used to being sh- on camera. It's like, and I think like if it's in their brains from a young age where, yeah, like sometimes you just take pictures or something. I think people are going to be less and less scared of the camera. However, it's a huge differentiator when I'm doing backseat rider, when they, they just see a little tiny lav mic right in front of them. There's a couple of lav mics in the backseat. They're way more candid than if there were cameras everywhere. And I've done, I've done videos as well in the car for certain projects. And um, people are, are more candid when it's just audio. And it's, I think there's something, you know, I was very skeptical of audio when I was a video, when I was a TV guy, because I was just like, oh, well, TV is so much more powerful because you get to see the images and, and hear the audio. However, there's an argument to be made for audio. The power of audio is interesting because it's like reading a book where you it's, 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 it's more active. Your brain is more engaged in a certain way because you're not just getting spoon fed the images, right? For a lot of my interviewees, they're really compelling. And what I know, and I've heard from my listeners is they're forming their own pictures in their minds of who this, what this person looks like, where, you know, um, they're, they're for, they're, it's kind of interactive in that way, in the same way that when you're reading a book, and you're super into the book, the author is creating a certain parameters for you. But in the end, it's your own imagination that is filling in the gaps. And I think that's kind of where the, a lot of the magic is. And so audio is so, so powerful in that respect. I think that a lot, I'm giving voice to a lot of people that may go under the radar based on their appearance or, you know how you like judge people? You're, you subconsciously yeah. judge people on their appearance and like where they are. And I think that with podcasting and, and, and backseat rider, people are, people are listening really, really intently through these earbuds. And it doesn't matter if they look a certain way, like they're, they're, uh, they're having a, they're each, everyone's having their own unique storytelling experience. So that's kind of what separates audio uh, from video. And I think that, that's why podcasts are so power. Certain podcasts are so powerful. Yeah, I've even heard a uh, Gary. Are you familiar with Gary Vaynerchuk? I'm not. He's you. Oh, you need to you need to look him up. So he okay. he basically is saying podcasting and voice is basically what's hot right now. Mm. Uh, yeah. So you, you seriously he and he he kind of is one of those guys. He he kind of he didn't he doesn't predict stuff, but he kind of sees things early on yeah. and invests in social media companies. And he says, if you can find a way to integrate yourself with like the Amazon Alexas or like the Google Homes, he's like, that's where you can, because nobody's doing it right now. Yeah. Um, so he thinks podcasting is a really, you know, like, again, it's sort of like going back to radio, but you can do so many things while you're just listening where you can't watch TV. For oh, instance, totally. I, I would love to be able yeah. to be on Alexa and be like, hey, Alexa, yeah, like, back to your rider while I vacuum. Exactly. And I do a lot of, uh, in the back, and this is my sewing studio, and I do a lot of sewing, and I can really, like, it's hard for me to watch something while I'm sewing because you have to right. concentrate. So I listen to podcasts pretty much all day long. So yeah. I to whatever, so, you know, I'll find one, and then you just start. And it's, you know, kind of nice because it just goes from one episode to another, and mm-hmm. it's really easy to listen to and absorb the information or do audiobooks. So I think you're really, I think you're really onto something. Plus, I think people are more comfortable with you in the, in the car, just having their voice recorded. So, and what, Thank you very much. what other things do you have planned for the, the future here? Um, yeah. So there, um, okay. I want to really, this year, my goal is to be more experimental in my storytelling. Um, and I've already started doing that in 2018 where we all fall into routines 
And um, I want to perhaps use passengers as a catalyst to tell bigger stories. Like for example, this week, um, I interviewed this woman who is a self-described sugar baby. Are you familiar with oh, yes, I am. sugar babies and oh, yes. sugar daddies and sugar dating? Unfortunately, and I actually had a, an old friend I knew from a uh, Christian organization. She uh, grew up in, it, it was kind of interesting. She went in a different direction and she actually blogged about her sugar baby experience. Okay. Yeah. So, so I'm, this, I know, is I, a whole, <laughs> this is a whole world that I was I know, right? unfamiliar with. And a lot of people aren't familiar with there's these websites. Um, it's a big, big, I don't, I'm, I don't, do I call it an industry? Maybe. It, it um, really, it, like there are maybe. women that are doing this like as a, like the, the oh, yeah. sugar daddy will give them five grand out. a month. Yeah, right. That's exactly. Nice, right? The, the, the passenger that I was driving and this episode is going to air tomorrow. She was on her way to this fancy restaurant and she was about to be paid a thousand dollars just to go to the dinner. And so that's an example of where my show up until this point has been purely limited to interviews in the car, right? Where I could use that and, hey, maybe I break down this industry and talk to um, different sources about what the implications are for uh, this sugar dating phenomenon. Is this um, is this female empowerment? Is it the exact opposite of female empowerment? Does the answer lie somewhere in the middle? Um, I need to find a sugar daddy now to, to, to comment on this. Yeah. Why do they do this? Um, you know, really um, kind of getting, uh, essentially getting out of the car. So like in, I've, I have amazing interviews in the car itself um, it, from the back seat to the front, but I think my goal in 2018 is really to kind of branch out and, and see what kind of uh, storytelling I can create and really tap into more creativity. Um, I, I've written all the music for Backseat Rider. and Oh, uh, you do all the music for it? Yeah, and uh, composing more music. I, I did the music for that viral video as well. Um, writing more music, composing more music, um, expanding the production value of it. Um, so bringing more creativity is, is in my, um, is in my 2018 to do list. And I hope that the audience responds. Very cool. Well, I'm excited. And where can people find Be Backseat Rider and all of your social media accounts here? Yeah. Um, people can find Backseat Rider on iTunes on the Apple podcasts app, which is on every iPhone. If you have an Android download the podcast one app, there's a couple hundred great podcasts on, on that. I'm one of them. Um, and then if you want to, if you just have a standard computer and you just want to listen and stream it off a website, my website is backseatridershow.com. And then you can just click on episodes and listen to any of the episodes. And then um, on social media, I'm at Anthony Ponce TV on Instagram and Twitter. And then just Anthony Ponce on Facebook. The last name is spelled P-O-N-C-E. All right. Well, I'll link everything below. And I have to ask, what did your family think when you told them you were doing this, especially your dad and your brother? Yeah, they were, um, I think they were skeptical at first. And that viral video helped them believe. But I, they, they believed in what I was doing because I was pretty passionate about, um, you know, I had been driving for months before I decided to make that announcement I, and, and recording passengers. Like I was essentially piloting the idea in my own head before I pulled the trigger on it. So they knew that I had that the idea had legs. They were a little bit scared and skeptical because you know I am 39. I have a wife and a kid, and I did walk away from a nice salary. Um, but they were optimistic for me, and I think after that, um, after that video, they were sold on the idea. And they've listened. They've each listened to every episode of Backseat Rider since. And uh, I know they they're biased because they're rooting for me, but I think. Uh, if it was a bad show, if it was a bad podcast, they wouldn't have listened to everything. They would tell you. Well, I, that brings, you brought up something interesting. So to, in order to do this, you, I, I read that you and your wife had done some things financially. And obviously, oh, yeah. this is not something you just did on a whim. You did some research. You piloted the, the idea. And right. did this alongside your job. What would you tell people if they wanted to do something like what you did? 
uh, financially or, you know, in your own personal situation to kind of prepare for this or get well, ready for yeah, it? Yeah, have a, have a plan in place. I mean, a, this, was a, this was a joint decision with me and my wife. We agreed on a certain amount of runway. Uh, and I actually have, I'm working part-time as well um, for a show that's on the CW. Um, where are you located, Jennifer? I'm in Atlanta. You're in Atlanta? Okay, so we're on in, um, I'm on a morning kind of social media show that's on the CW in Miami, Houston, Dallas, Portland, Philly. It's called Morning Dose. Um, and it's a, and so I have supplementary income on that side. I do cut-ins for them, which are brief reports, um, a couple hours, a, or a couple times per hour, a uh, couple, two to three days a week. And, um, and so have a plan. I mean, I didn't just like step off a cliff, you know, we had a little bit saved up. My parents um, said we could move in. Um, it's a temporary situation, but like, you know, you'll read a lot of founders and, uh, you know, entrepreneurs, they will like move into their parents' basement while they're getting their uh, ducks in a row. I'm no different. This is my parents' garage. All right, you're getting a tour? Is that a cat in the back? All yeah, right. they, I like that's their house already. Artwork. This is the this is the back garage. It's like a coach house. All right, that those are some nice digs there. Yeah, and then here I'll show you the main house. All right, can I move in too? Yeah, you can move in. All there's right, that's in nice. Bit. It's probably hard to see, but there's a main house there. So we we were lucky enough to have this near our actual house, and so that was part of the plan as well. <laughs> I that's don't think a great place. Yeah, I don't think I could have done this um, without help from the rents. And uh, I'm, I've always been pretty open about that. Um, and there, there's going to be a certain point, though, that if my audience doesn't grow mm. in a certain way, then I'm going to have to readjust. Now, I do want to ask you, I saw you have a YouTube channel and you post. Is that something you would, you would think about doing Maybe, more heavily? Yeah, it's, I it's think you should. I really do. Totally, it's totally on my list. Um, I do have a YouTube channel. I'm not even sure. This is pathetic, but I don't even know the name of it offhand. Um, I'll, I'll link it below because I found it and I also yeah. found some very uh, fun clips of you and your I found uh, one of you ballroom dancing uh, oh, yeah. one of you I you did something with your brother called like you did a spoof of that like a uh, about that you did like oh, a something B -roll. about like yeah. Yeah, we yeah. got that b-roll you did the anchorman thing that was a spoof of piano man and then I saw a video of you and your brother and your dad like singing the national anthem so I think you you definitely could and I would say like if I was if I was you I would probably maybe vlog a little bit about your entrepreneurial experience, mm -hmm. like not tape the people in the backseat. Cause obviously we talked about that, but yeah. more showing your journey on a personal side. And that would almost give a supplement to the podcast. Like, Hey guys, if you want to see my blog from this week, I'm posting it on YouTube because you're obviously you're uh, you have a lot of TV experience. And I think that yeah, actually, really, that's a really good idea. You on I've, I've, I've thought about that in the past and it's uh, it's that's as well on my list. But and you're a great that. storyteller, so I would love to see you see you over here more. But uh, I appreciate that, and good luck to you. Good well, thank you, you so much. I, I admire what you're doing as well. It's a, it has a lot in common with with what I exactly. Yeah, yeah to do this, we sold we sold our house. Oh wow! So we sold. So what my situation was, I you know, like you, I my job wasn't creative at all, and I wanted to do more of my own projects. I had been doing a sewing YouTube channel for two years, hmm. and it had just started to make not a ton of money, but enough where it made a difference. So we talked about it and we're like, how can we make this happen? We don't have any kids. We're not going to have a kids. Um, so we were in a situation where if we sold our house, we could pay off all of our student loans and have some money. So we mm. decided to, we went ahead and did that. So now we're, we moved into an apartment. Mm -hmm. But again, Atlanta is pretty low cost of living. Mm -hmm. um, my husband has a great job and the sewing channel had started to make money and quitting allowed me to really crank up the number of videos I was doing and also start a couple other channels That's uh, to awesome. experiment with. So I, I'll be I, following along. Good luck to you. Thank That's, you. I uh, totally know where you're coming you. from and it, it is a tough decision. It's something you, you shouldn't just do. You should definitely plan, plan for and really oh, yeah. figure, figure out the numbers to see if you can do it. Well, I want to give you the opportunity to ask this audience any question you would like. It doesn't have to be related to anything we talked about, any question you want. Mm, for the audience. Um, who Maybe you're doing you know? some market research. Yeah. Um, let's see. Who, do you know? 
who most of your audience is? Do you have any demographics? Not, you know, it's a, probably a lot of news people. They seem to be the ones watching some of these. Um, I would ask them um, for a upcoming show idea then. Um, if you could tap the brain of a stranger that you, a group of strangers that you meet, um, what should I ask my next set of passengers uh, for an upcoming show? What intriguing question that would lead to good stories? Um, another way to frame that would be, um, what, what would be a good question to ask my passengers that would lead to intriguing stories? All right, that would be, I would like to, your audience's take on that because I have my own audience members that have some good ideas and also some kind of cockamamie ideas. But I always like hearing people's ideas because it gets my brain kind of churning. So maybe your audience could chime in on that. What should I ask my passengers? I like it, I like it. All right, guys, <laughs> if you're watching, answer Anthony's question. What would you like him to ask his backseat riders? Anthony, thank you so much. I'm really excited to have you on. Like, I was like, I was like, when I first thought of this idea, I was like, I have to try to reach out to this guy and see if he would maybe even entertain the idea. It so was my I pleasure. I, I, happening. My pleasure. It was great to, great to meet you virtually here and uh, wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much. And, and guys, if you want to subscribe to this channel, we're going to be interviewing other ex-TV newsers like Anthony. And if you'd like to be featured on this show, feel free to leave me a comment or find me on Twitter. I'm at XTV producer. I'll see you guys next time.